Any decision can have unforeseen side effects that could either be positive or negative. And depending on what it is, the ramifications can reach far or near. A smile that makes someone's day or prioritizing of company stock over asset maintenance. One can lead possibly to a generous tip. The other can result in an entire town being contaminated with deadly chemicals. Each decision can reach far beyond than originally intended. But our story today takes place in Ohio, in a town that probably before 2023, not that many people would have known about. A decision of profit over everything else would result in this. That is, of the East Palestine train derailment, fire and contamination. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my patrons and YouTube members. If you want to see my videos at free and early access, then feel free to check it out. I've been waiting to cover this subject for quite a while, right from when it happened. It feels really in my niche, and with the NTSB final report out, we won't need to speculate too much. Just a quick warning though, there may be some train geekery involved in this week's video. A small town. East Palestine, the scene of our disaster, has a history stretching way back to 1828. However, the name came around in 1833, mirroring other towns in the region that had taken on the names of places in the Middle East. Incorporated as East Palestine in 1875, and as an interesting side, Palestine was already incorporated, hence the name East. I really do think city names are not really the most original. Anywho, the city gained a railway line in 1851. After many years of extensions, company mergers and the usual 1800s railway shenanigans, the city would be linked to Pittsburgh to the east and Chicago to the west. But let's fast forward to, you know, the modern day and talk about the line through the small city. A vital line. The line through the town or city is run by freight operator Norfolk Southern with an estimated 46 trains passing through daily. The line for the town is the Fort Wayne line. It is, as I mentioned earlier, pretty busy, and as such, the route is a double track affair through the city. The line is controlled by cab signaling with positive train control overlaid, and the speed limit through the city is 50 miles an hour for all trains. Norfolk Southern is a massive freight operator, as said, by the NTSB in their final report. NS is categorised as a Class 1 railroad under the Surface Transportation Board regulation. NS operates about 19,420 route miles of track in 22 states and has rights in Canada. So not a small time operation by any stretch. As the operator works in freight, often trains are made up of mixed cargo in various different types of railcar but although different in cargo use, they all work on the same principle as any train type, and that is steel wheel on steel rail. I know I've covered this before in previous videos, but for a refresher, let's quickly talk about train wheels. Train wheels, axles and track. So trains are an efficient way to transport things around. There are a few reasons, but the main one is the fact that they have reduced friction. You see the actual surface each train wheel has on the track is pretty small. This means that you can have hundreds of tons focused on an area of just a few inches. Train wheels have a conical shape with a flange which stop the wheel from running off the rail. This means that trains don't need to be manually steered as the wheels and ultimately the bogies attached to it follow the route of the track. So I know this is all very basic stuff but context is always key in these things. Now wheels are usually mounted on axles, which pair up with its opposite partner wheel. This is called a wheel set. This means each pair of wheels don't work independently. So how are these axles attached to their bogey or truck for those of you across the pond? Well, this is done via a piece of kit called the axle box in which houses the bearing set. You see, when you're rolling along, you want to keep your momentum and a good bearing allows this without having too much turning loss from friction. 
bearings have changed over the years on the railway, from oiled packing to these bad boys, the roller bearing. This type of bearing carries the load via cylindrical rollers. Although greased and sealed from external contaminants, over time they can dry out, wear out or just generally degrade. Like all machines, they need to be monitored, maintained and, when required, replaced. To aid this, many railways have things called hot axle box detectors. These machines are installed trackside and monitor the temperature of passing trains' axles. If found to be hot, they are reported to the train's operator and the appropriate action can be taken. On Norfolk Southern routes, these hot axle box detectors are placed roughly 13 miles apart from one another. For Norfolk Southern, axle temperatures are reported to the ATC Wayside Help Desk, which will give two types of warning, an alert or alarm. An alert will trigger if the temperature is above 90 degrees Fahrenheit ambient temperature. These aren't normally passed on to train crews. However, if the temperature goes above 170 degrees Fahrenheit, then an alarm is triggered, which is then directly communicated to the train crew. Now remember all this for later. Right, I've held you up long enough, let's get on to the disaster. The disaster. It is the 1st of February 2023, and Norfolk Southern had just received a train at their Terminal Railroad Association of St. Louis yard in Madison, Illinois. The formation, called 32N, was inspected and this included performing a brake test and a mechanical inspection. The train at that point had consisted of three locomotives and 163 freight carriages of various cargoes. One of which, for our story is very important, was a hopper car with a number GPLX 75465. The inspection did not see any defects, thus no reports were put in. As such, the train was approved for departure. The train departed around 10pm the same day en route for Conway Yard in Conway, Pennsylvania. There would be a few stops along the way, and when it reached Decatur, Illinois at 6.10am on the 2nd of February, 55 rail cars were removed and 40 were added, along with a locomotive being located from the front of the consist. 32N departed Decatur Rail Yard at 4.15pm the same day. At departure, the formation consisted of three locomotives and 149 mixed freight cars. The train carried on to Toledo, Ohio, where the crew was changed over. This was at 1pm. At around six and a half hours later, the train passed a hot axle box detector. This was in Sebring, Ohio. A temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient was recorded at 7.35pm on hopper car GPLX 75465. The train continued. And around half an hour later, CCTV footage from alongside the line caught the hopper car with what looks like fire coming from one of its wheel sets. The train then passed the next hot axle box detector. This time the temperature was recorded at 103 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature was over the 90 degrees Fahrenheit threshold and was able to trigger an alert. This was processed at the ATC centre, but it was just an alert and wasn't communicated to the train's crew. The train was now beginning to approach East Palestine. The time is around 8.50pm. It was travelling 7 miles an hour below the maximum speed of 50. The train ran past the hot axle box detector. The temperature of the hopper car had now hit over 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This triggered a critical alarm, which was broadcast to the train's crew via the cab radio speaker. The rules for this would require the train to be immediately brought to a halt. However, the driver didn't put on the emergency brakes, instead applying the dynamic brakes to slowly bring the train to a stop. The train experienced a train line initiated emergency braking application. This is caused when the train's brake line drops significantly in pressure, which is sometimes caused by a breakaway, that is part of the train's air line being divided. Even though the train's emergency brakes had been applied, it would still travel for around 1,160 feet before finally coming to a stand some 38 seconds later. The engineer of the train radioed Norfolk Southern Dispatch to inform them of the emergency brake application. The dispatcher confirmed this and then began working to stop all other train movements in the area. While this scene was unfolding for the train crew, way back at the hopper car something far more concerning had happened. The hopper carriage had come off the track, followed by some 51 cars. 
derailing on the east side of East Palestine, 49 of which would pile up. Almost immediately, the crash resulted in fire. 911 calls came in from the city with reports of fires and explosions. The time was now 8.56 p.m. The emergency was conveyed to the fire department at 8.58 p.m. Units were dispatched to the crash site. The fire departments from neighbouring communities were also dispatched, reaching a total of 48 agencies being eventually involved in the emergency response. Upon arriving, firefighters were confronted with a terrible sight. Bellowing fire and a pool of flames ran along the whole length of the derailed portion of the train. At around 9pm, emergency services dispatch contacted the Norfolk Southern Dispatch to request the train's consist. This would tell them what they were dealing with, but although told by Norfolk Southern they would be rung back, no return call was made. A command post was set up roughly 400 feet from the fire. As the blaze was attacked, nothing seemed to be effectively quelling the flames. As the fire was battled, the train crew obtained permission to detach the leading two locomotives and run them down the line by roughly a mile. After multiple calls, the train consist was finally received from Norfolk Southern. This was at around 10pm. The information the fire chief received was concerning. Multiple dangerous chemicals were being hauled on train 32N. A one mile exclusion zone was set up around the blaze. Residents within the area were told to shelter in place. But after 11pm this changed to an evacuation order. The smoke and darkness made identifying tank cars very difficult and on the advice of Norfolk Southern and independent contractors specialising in hazardous chemicals, all personnel and equipment were also moved back to the one mile radius of the exclusion zone. A fire in a ditch along the south side of the tracks ignited tank cars containing butyl acrylates, ethyl glyco monobutyl ether, 2 ethyhexyl acrylate, propylene glycol, diethylene glycol, lubricating oil and cars containing plastic pellets. This toxic smoke ascended into the sky over East Palestine. By the early hours in the morning of the 4th of February, firefighting efforts moved towards containment by dousing the buildings around the perimeter with water. However, nothing was particularly directed at the fire. The command post would move once again slightly further away from the fire. On the 5th of February, fear started creeping in that the intact tanker cars, of which there were five, could run the risk of exploding if exposed to too much heat. Interestingly, eventually the fire by the end of the 5th was largely subdued. The heat had raised the question of polymerization in the five vinyl chloride tanker cars. On-site contractor personnel used infrared thermometers to inspect the five tanker cars. These were carrying vinyl chloride monomer. The resulting measurements showed tank car OCPX80370 was experiencing elevated temperatures. The fear was that polymerization was taking place. However, there was some doubt that this was actually happening. Oxyvinyls, the manufacturer and shipper of the chemicals within the tank cars, would later state that they did not believe polymerization was happening. However, the company, although providing assistance with the emergency workers, didn't actually have direct communications with the incident commander. On site, the decision was made that the tanks had to be vented and the Norfolk Southern contractor released the vinyl chloride monomer on the 6th at 4.37pm by setting off explosives on each tank with a flare nearby to set fire to the chemicals, burning off the contents. The site after the 8th was put into a state where traffic could resume along the unaffected track. However, the disaster was not over. The chemicals spilled and released into the environment would prove to not be a good thing. Go figure. By the 8th of February, the disaster had killed an estimated 3,500 small fish across 7.5 miles of streams in the nearby area. The number would increase, with by the end of February, an estimated 43,000 fish, crustaceans and amphibians, as well as other marine animals were killed. Up to 10 miles away from the disaster site, locals would report that their small pets were dying around the 6th and 7th of February. But confusingly, the official channels were saying that there was no risk to humans. Reports of people feeling sick from the release were largely played down. An extensive cleanup was undertaken, with riverbeds being aerated to release chemicals, as well as 167,000 tonnes of contaminated soil being removed and millions of gallons of contaminated water first being stored inside these massive tanks 
to then be transported off-site for disposal. By June 2024, the cleanup had largely been completed, with the EPA starting to wind down operations. Now, it's hardly a surprise that the disaster would yield a few lawsuits. This was three class action lawsuits against Norfolk Southern Railway. It would result in a $600 million settlement. Included in that was 10-year testing of drinking water, 20-year community health program for East Palestine residents, and a 10-year monitoring of surface and groundwater program. However, no money in the world would make you feel safe. I can assume, especially when a toxic gas cloud has descended upon your house. Plus, on top of that, I can imagine selling your house in East Palestine would be a bit of a tough ask. Now that it is time for us to move on to the investigation, which very handily had its final report released fairly recently. The Investigation so being a train crash, the disaster would be probed into by long-term friends of the channel, the NTSB. They were present not long after the crash had occurred and had assisted with the disaster management. On top of this, they were able to start collecting evidence right from the start. And being only happening around a year ago, of course, there were hundreds of hours of footage from CCTV, mobile phones and Norfolk Southern cameras that had to be sifted through. The derailment was caused by an axle separating due to the axle box that had overheated. This was the initiating cause of the disaster. It was pointed to by the critical alarm about the hot axle box. The investigation would rule out a rather long list of factors, which included the train's crew, track signals and the design of the tank cars. Although the cause of the derailment was known, the underlying cause of the rot within Norfolk Southern needed to be outed. You see, the company, like the rest of the big four freight rail operators in the US, had been cutting back on costs. And what was better, they cut back on staff, maintenance and infrastructure. The company relied on hot axle box detectors, even though they were known to not be the most accurate and only an indication of what could be happening, as they only record outside temperatures, which understandably would be a lot lower than the inside bearing temperature. The NTSB found that heat thresholds were not low enough, thus allowing a hot axle to continue to worsen, which when combined with the large distances between detectors, didn't give enough warning to train crews. But the company higher ups seemingly were more interested in lining their pockets, as during 2022, the company bought back off shareholders around $10 billion of stock. Some of the largest buys were Alan Shaw, Norfolk Southern CEO, and firm's director James Squires, who sold back to the company 2,000 and over 20,000 shares respectively. So whilst the company was cutting back on frontline operations, money was flowing out to the shareholders, which is not really the most surprising. Interestingly, during the accident analysis, the vent and burn of the vinyl chloride was likely unneeded, as noted in the NTSB report. Post-accident examinations found no solidified chemical matter blocking pressure relief devices and other tank cars, service equipment, openings. Do not indicate that polymerization reaction occurred within any of the five chloride monomer tank cars. And the vinyl chloride monomer within the derail DOT 105 cars remained in a stabilized environment until the vent and burn and did not undergo polymerization. The vent and burn procedure was not necessary, a polymerized induced tank rupture. The burn was the biggest cause of pollution from the disaster and it turned out it was completely pointless. So you know that's grand. The NTSB would release their final report in June 2024 after its final board meeting during which the NTSB accused Norfolk Southern of threatening the board as noted in Reuters. The chair of the National Transport Safety Board said Norfolk Southern threatened the board, sought to manufacture evidence and failed to provide documents during its investigation of the 2023 Ohio derailment. Somehow, I am rather not surprised by this. Now, the ongoing longer term issues to the disaster are still unfolding, but safety hasn't massively improved as three more accidents would occur with Norfolk Southern since East Palestine. Norfolk Southern have claimed, however, improvements with added hot axle box detectors, including improved acoustic hot axle box detectors and machine learning imaging portals. 
So let's hope that this does actually improve safety. Right, so it's scale time. No official human deaths make it a two, but animal death makes it at least a nine. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Please let me know in the comments below. This is a plain difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. Plain difficult videos we use might be John, the currently quite cold corner of Southern London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next video.